This is Critical Issues, Alternative Views. Welcome to our program. My name is Ron Kramer. I'm a professor of sociology at Western Michigan University, and I serve as the host for the program. And I'd like to introduce a couple of our regular viewmeisters. Uh, we're going to reach back into the past today because we have a very special guest. And <laughs> our uh, former producer, Bill O'Brien, used to call us viewmeisters. So, uh, That's so right. uh, That's first right. viewmeister I'm going to introduce is on my right here, Denise Keel. Uh, Denise is a professor in the political science mm -hmm. department. She's also affiliated with the Institute of the Environment okay. and Sustainability. Good job. And she also serves as the chair of the WMU Climate Change Working Group. Uh, on my far left, and he usually is on the far left in most things <laughs> political, uh, is Don Cooney. Uh, Don is a professor in the School of Social Work at Western Michigan University, and he's on the city commission. And are, you, are you still the vice mayor? No. No, no, Just you gave up that position? Okay, so uh, formerly the vice mayor of the city of Kalamazoo. And our special guest is uh, Lynn Bartley, and uh, longtime viewers of Critical Issues will certainly recognize Lynn. Yes. Lynn was one of the founding members of the collective that produces this program, and he served as the host for many, many years. Uh, so, so Lynn uh, is mainly responsible, I would say, for getting <laughs> Critical Issues uh, going as, a, as an adventure with Bill O'Brien uh, a few years ago. And uh, Lynn was also a professor at Western Michigan University. He was in the School of Communication. Mm -hmm. He's a media expert, one of the reasons we wanted him to come on today. Mm -hmm. He also dabbled in some political activities as the president of the American Association of University Professors right. at Western. That was a very political position. Very time, political. Yeah. <laughs> so we're very, very happy to welcome Lynn Bartley back to Critical Issues. Uh, looks great to see you sitting in one of those chairs again, my mm -hmm. friend. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> it's great to be here. <laughs> So what have you been up to uh, in, in retirement here? Are you still uh, focusing on the uh, media issues? I, I am focusing <laughs> on the media issues because it's, um, it seems to be driving so many other kinds of things in our culture. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you know, you can't think of an academic discipline, really, which, mm -hmm. uh, which ought not to be taking a look at what's going on. Yeah. yeah. And um, certainly um, the, um, the role of the media in public influence is the way mm -hmm. I, the broad public influence, mm -hmm. is um, hidden mm -hmm. from most people. Yeah, and that's yeah. what I hope we talk a bit about. Um, hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain <laughs> sight, yes, <laughs> hidden in plain yeah, sight. Yeah. So, um, well, we're going to touch on the media in a number of topics today. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to get back, because of Len's expertise in the media, we want to come back and look at some of the more general issues, particularly talking about the media and the Trump era. Yeah. But uh, we want to start off by looking at uh, a couple of big news events that took place this past week. Uh, one is the State of the Union address that Trump delivered last uh, Tuesday. And uh, of course, the other big story that's sort of percolating mm -hmm. in Washington right now is the impending release of this secret memo. Uh, yeah. the Devin Nunes, the congressman from California who chairs the uh, House Intelligence Committee is set to release some kind of a memo uh, which, so we'll get back to that in a moment uh, because this has become a very controversial issue. But let's start by looking back at the State of the Union address. And so uh, any particular takes? Denise, uh, did you watch it? And, of course. Uh, what, what kind of reactions <laughs> of did you have? One of the longest, so that he can claim, I think fourth longest uh, State of the Union. No, was, not, not in terms of words, no, but, in, but in the terms length of, length. of time so, for him to deliver You know, I, a, a good teleprompter reader um, made <laughs> sure that he was slowly, so it was difficult. I, I almost fell asleep. But no, I, I, did, I did stay up and watch it live. Um, of course, striking from the climate change perspective to lead that speech by talking about the natural disasters in Puerto Rico and the hurricanes and not to make the connection to climate no, no change. No mention, no mention and, at all. You know, no. We're bailing out uh, these communities and to make that about uh, the American spirit somehow, um, these tragedies mm -hmm. that could be prevented and that we know what's causing them was uh, a pretty unfortunate way in my opinion. Uh, to start that speech. The only other energy environment references we got uh, were to beautiful clean coal. Right? Oh, yeah. um, clean coal. And yes. to bring back nuclear, <laughs> which is uh, uh, not, not where this country ought to be going, as we've discussed many, many times. 
Um, I think the fact checker site crashed again, uh, <laughs> right? As they were as they're trying to, to go through the speech, which that's the, the age that, you know, part of, of your discussion and, and what we need to talk about. Uh, lot, uh, I think the last report is about half was maybe true. Um, this thing, uh, you know, deregulation is a big theme. The economics, of course, he thinks mm -hmm. he can, you know, talk about the tax bill, but not a lot of other substance in there. Yeah, it was interesting yeah. for that as a state of the union mm -hmm. to not really mm -hmm. be putting forward any other policy prescriptions. And now I'm a real uh, nerd, a wonk, right? A policy, no, spelled backward, K-N-O-W, <coughs> wonk. So the day before the History Channel started showing all the, the taped, televised, State of the unions from first term oh, presidents. Mm. So I watched like six of these oh, before oh, I went wow. into them. And they, you know, it was great to watch <laughs> the Bushes and the Clinton, you know, talking about actual policies. Very it's policy not just specific, what yeah. I have done, mm -hmm. what ought we do together. And yeah. you didn't hear that in his speech. So that would be a big, a big difference for yeah. me. Yeah. Don, yeah. your take on the... Well, Kathy and I were running out of socks to throw in the screen, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, I, uh, some things were um, really enraging. Uh, yeah. The identification of immigrants yeah. with the gang in California um, and to try to, to demonize uh, all the immigrants that are yeah. coming to this country was so outrageous and so painful. Yeah. Uh, and... That, that really angered me. Um, again, the taking the swipe at the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement mm -hmm. when uh, he went after the football players who are yes. kneeling and not standing for the national anthem. Those things were really terrible. We just had William Hartung here. Yes. And when he talks about dramatically increasing military spending, yeah. and everybody on the Republican side stands up and cheers for that, it is outrageous. Um, yeah. A guy like Hartung is so important now because most of the people in the country have no idea about how we compare with the rest of the world. Um, the, the other thing was um, um, the, the nuclear, the idea yeah. that we need to expand our nuclear and we have to make it uh, more updated. Uh, when William Hartung was here, he said, you know, there is a question of whether nuclear weapons are moral at all. Mm -hmm. But if you accept the idea that they're moral, we would need 300 of them. We have 4,000 now. Right. Mm -hmm. We should be moving in the opposite direction, getting rid of them. And to me, that, that was just outrageous yeah. that, that he's pushing that and then these guys stand up and cheer for that. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing was, there was absolutely no benefit to stick a thumb in the Korean people's mm -hmm, eye. Mm -hmm. I mean, why do that? I know. Why not try to work towards some kind of way out of this rather than just antagonize? Mm -hmm. So overall, I thought it was a, a, a terrible, terrible thing mm -hmm. for the country to have somebody up there and then to completely ignore not only climate change, yeah. but the whole situation of mass incarceration, right. mm -hmm. people that are um, poor in this country and not able to meet their mm -hmm. basic needs. Mm -hmm. And the, his reference to the health care crisis yeah. that we cut the core out of um, the Affordable Care Act, those things are so offensive. So mm -hmm. that, there are some of the things I picked up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Lynn, uh, the State of the Union is a, a media spectacle. Of yeah. Sorts. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. so, exactly. so how did the Donald do? How did he perform? <laughs> well, uh, from a media I think he scored think? very high <laughs> on uh, on decontextualized information. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, Give him an A plus. Right? Give him an A plus for that. <laughs> sound bites. <laughs> uh, yeah, sound bites. Um, you know, it was. Uh, I would describe it as squirmish. The way I felt, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. it was um, uh, if, if ever there was somebody who was uh, having a public experience of depression, um, <laughs> it would be him. I mean, everything that he brought up yeah. almost was mm -hmm. negative. Yeah. It's true. Was um, oh, that's a good uh, point. Uh, and then glorification of his own capacity, which is absent, I think, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. fix some of those things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, as I sat there, I kept, I got it here, this, he had a kind of detextualized 
um, information. Yeah. He talked about things that I would guess only the more, um, uh, the more people who keep in touch with what's going on would know what it's talking yeah. about. Yes. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I was curious as to whether other um, uh, presidential speeches like that mm -hmm. um, really created a context for what they were saying. And what you were saying that's, is that they, they did. did. Yeah. That's and, right. um, it was a very different speech. You know, it's the kind of thing where it, it leads one to a position where uh, you get the creepy feeling you've done something wrong, but you don't really know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, he's, he is really not mindful. He's an undermine mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Certainly looking mm -hmm. at uh, the U.S. through a glass mm -hmm. darkly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right. It's a great point about the context, um, because I have... Uh, again, you know, I, I let my students uh, get extra credit to do all sorts of things that get them out in the community or watch. So watching the speech was one of them. Okay. And they were so confused because the, the, the main oh, really? question they had for me the next morning was, what was he even saying? Right. Because, you know, they're very, you know, savvy in some ways. Sure. Um, but again, I think your point about if you weren't already plugged into this issue and this wasn't something you knew to boo or cheer, you had, what was he saying? The word, if you look at the, tra I had one student who read the transcript instead and was like, these words don't even go together. <laughs> and I, said, okay. yeah, and I, I think um, yeah. that what that means for me looking at the media is that the media is, uh, is continuing to lose its power and capacity to inform. Yeah. When you think about what were the reasons for what he was promoting? Mm -hmm. There's nothing there. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. So what they do is they report, this is what happened without any kind of analysis right. or critique. Yep. It's, it's the decontextualized information. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What, what uh, struck me, uh, again, and, and this is consistent with his performance uh, across the board, uh, the continual lies. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. just one lie after another. or. If it's not a lie, it's a distortion. Right. A distortion. Uh, yeah. And and again, a lot of it is in the context of boosting himself. Mm -hmm. It's this boosterism and boasting, you know. Yeah. And so he talks about the economy and the, you know the growth and jobs. Well, you know we've had job growth for 88 straight months, <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, and that's all not due to Donald Trump, right? right? And right. he gives yeah. no credit to Obama. Mm -hmm. He acts as if any good economic news, which is coming out of the Obama economy is something he's personally right. been responsible right. for, although he wouldn't be able to point to a single piece of legislation. <laughs> well, he wouldn't be uh, able to actually or, describe the context of that, right? Again, yeah. yeah, no, no. Yeah. So it's just like, you know, all these things are happening, it's all happening because of me, uh, yeah. and then again, just beyond that, just the steady stream of lies. And again, the fact checkers yeah. uh, just have a field day because That's they right. just can't keep up with them. I mean, <laughs> he, right. he tells so many lies during the course of a typical speech That's that right. even the fact checkers crash, crash. Right? because they can't, <laughs> they they cannot, can't keep up. Yes. Now, you know, I know all politicians lie to some extent, right? Mm -hmm. They all disassemble, they all fudge statistics mm -hmm. here and there. I think every president has probably done yeah. that, mm -hmm. going back to George Washington, right? But it seems that the level of lies and distortions that come from Trump are of a totally different nature, oh, yeah. a, a much higher level. And uh, it, to me, it's, a, it's much more frightening. I mean, I, I, oh, yeah. I can put up with an occasional shading of the truth by a politician to support a particular policy or to sh mm -hmm. you know, shield themselves from some mm -hmm. blame. But the level of lies and the mendacity of the lies that this man tells is just unbelievable. Yeah. And it's just so frightening for our country to have the leader continually telling the lies because, mm -hmm. again, that comes through the media to his base, his core followers, and they accept it. They don't, you know, they're, they're enthralled with his overall political perspective and what they think he's going to be able to do for the country that the lies somehow don't seem to matter, right. or right. maybe they don't even catch half of the lies that are being told. Yeah. I think we're in a, if we can't tell the truth from, from lies, uh, how do we move forward mm -hmm. in terms of oh. policy on anything, mm -hmm. whether it's climate change or the economy? Mm -hmm. and the, Very addi true. Ad additionally, um, uh, the television, I think, is, I don't know this for a fact, but I, I would bet television plays a bigger role in informing other mm -hmm. Uh, media, then does other media informing 
television. Mm, okay. So what gets on television seems to ha have a kind of, uh, of um, power mm -hmm. and a presence. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I wait till my four o'clock newspaper arrives before yeah. I, and I've already heard about it at eight o'clock in the morning. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, Who sits down and reads a long, boring New York Times article about the speech? That, yeah, you know, right. They're going to catch the right. snippet on Fox you News knew. or right. 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 even MSNBC right. or whatever, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and again, this, I mean, you've got uh, Neil Postman's book sitting there right in front of you. Yeah. And, and this is exactly what Postman was talking about, moving from a typographic culture, a culture based on reading and, and understanding the, the printed word and being able to analyze issues and problems to now what he called the, the screen culture, which mm -hmm. to him was mostly television. Of course, right. now we've got the other additional yeah. uh, social, social media, media that right. are, uh, come to us through screens. But that transition from the typographic culture to the video mm -hmm. graphic culture is just enormous. That's what you're talking about. Right. People yeah. get right. their information yeah. through television. Yeah. And it always mm -hmm. ends up being distorted in a very fundamental right. way. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and then the question of who benefits by the distortion mm -hmm. becomes a political question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and who uh, cannot create the change they want to change right. because they're, they... Uh, they're not, they're not getting the side of the story that they need to promote a different view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to say, uh, the, the adage to explain these things in politics used to be, you can have your own opinion on the facts, but you don't get to have your own facts. Right, right. And yeah. that's been the big seed change, right? Not just the media outlets, but in the last few years, you also get to have your own facts now. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. distorted yeah. it even more. Yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting in a way because uh, uh, even the fact checkers now come over the the most important medium, That's right. and that is television. Yeah, yeah. and right. it it has its losses when it's trans right. Right. when there's a transmission of information. Yeah, because yeah. they've got to cram it into that exactly. tiny space that's same. available. Exactly. And you don't have the the time to develop the context, right? right. I mean that the decontextualization is mm -hmm. a is a prime function of television itself, isn't it? Because right. you just don't have the time to present the mm -hmm. background and the context yeah. of most of these issues, right? Because right? you, we well, you got to cram the next commercial in, right? Oh, right. is, is it right. time for us to go to exactly. commercial? Exactly. That's uh, what we get. Uh, yeah. We have a luxury yeah. here. One of the nice things about yeah. our mm -hmm. form of television is that we can sit here for an hour and, and provide some context. But uh, with the regular mass media, the commercial media, you just don't have that luxury at all. That's no, right. and and one of the wonderful things here, I don't think we have any music before the program starts. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to change that? Do we no, need to get I, a band I, in I, here? I definitely. <laughs> we, we've got to have a theme. Get a, get a house band? Or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really interesting, this point about decontextualization and how it relates to the media, right, that role in there. Because I would say political scientists really started paying attention to this um, Bush v. Kerry. Uh, in that election, as Kerry would, and, and political scientists would uh, bemoan uh, the loss of nuance, mm -hmm. what I think you mean context, right? Mm -hmm. The whole story, that there is some gray, that there's a lot going on here to consider. And, you know, in those speeches and in those debates, you know, Kerry would give up, get up and give these long, nuanced answers right. that provided all this context mm -hmm. as to how he might have reached a policy. Boring. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. like right. no one has an appetite for that, you know? Well, and that's the media role. Plus, and then Bush would get up and say, it'll be all right. I'll take care of you. And everybody voted for yeah. him. Yeah, and we've right. seen that again and again. Let's, let's go have a beer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's about wetting this appetite. I think that's a very good point about the media. You know, are, are you used to really reading a whole book uh, or yeah. Facebook? So, yeah. so what's your example with students? Yeah. Or they, I asked my students the other day, yeah. how do you get your news? Yes. Uh -huh. Most of them, Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And we know how reliable yes, all that is. Exactly. Right. And, and then, but three or four of them, that said, well, um, sometimes I see, N see CNN or mm -hmm. I watch Fox News. Fox News is on at the gym, guy. apparently. I yeah, the student right. rec center yeah. <laughs> plays Fox News. <laughs> so when we have a group of people, young people who are in college, I don't know, maybe your experience is different with students, okay. aren't reading, That's aren't right. going into it, and don't know anything about the context, 
they are easily uh, driven in a, in a terrible way, I think. Agreed. And, and when I ask my students, it's the same thing. And uh, sometimes when I, I come into class, you know, a couple weeks ago, they all knew there was a 30 percent uh, tax on solar panels, right? And so they knew that. I thought, oh, wow, this is so impressive. You guys all know that. But then when you ask them another question and another question about, well, which solar panels and what does the tax do and who is it on and who made, they know nothing beyond that mm -hmm. face uh, value either, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I was reading um, something, actually reading the New York Times. Wow. Uh, th uh, there was a study about there is an increase now in subscriptions to New York Times, uh, yeah. the P Washington Post, and I think it was the LA, whatever the big LA paper LA is. LA Thank Times. you. Uh, that, I mean, and millennials, young people, were actually now oh, buying really? subscriptions. Now, they might be digital subscriptions. I don't care if you read on your iPad, but read. Read. Uh, right? Uh, the, right. They, were, they were starting to see an uptick in that, and uh, the, the, you know, they were trying to make this connection that the era of Trump might uh, have a, a backlash, and people mm -hmm. might start to try to read and understand their world a little bit more again. So maybe a good thing. I don't know if you've seen those, any of that work, but. I haven't. Okay. I've been busy reading posts. I was going to say, you've been busy reading posts. I, I totally understand. Yeah. So, Denise, is that a direct reflection on, on the Trump era? That That's again, so it seems to me that the New York Times and the Washington Post have, in fact, stepped up. Yes. That yeah. I think we're, I think getting, so. we're getting more and better coverage of the political scene mm -hmm. since yep. Trump came along. And maybe it's Agreed. because Trump attacks them so relentlessly, right? Right. Fake news, fake news, fake news. How many times mm -hmm. have we heard Donald Trump say fake news? Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. A million times. <laughs> and, and so I think because of that, he sort of issued a direct challenge to them yep. mm -hmm. and uh, accusing them of fake news. So I think they've doubled down in oh, a sense yeah. in mm -hmm. terms of let's cover this presidency, let's make sure we're accurate, let's make that's sure right. we're mm -hmm. digging right. and finding the stories that are behind the scenes. Because it seems to me, and then then that gets translated to television, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's been an interesting phenomenon. So I watch mm -hmm. a lot of MSNBC. Yeah. Every night, sort of watch Chris Matthews and Rachel Maddow mm -hmm. and Lawrence O'Donnell, and that's that's one way I, I try to, to keep up while mm -hmm. I'm working on something else. But it's amazing to me how often the lead in any one of those MSNBC stories is the New York Times today yes. published this article, or the Washington Post that's is right, confirming. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're feeding off of those newspaper right. reports, mm -hmm. then they amplify it. Of course, they, uh, sometimes Rachel will bring in I the reporter who right. wrote the story for the New York yes. Times to get a more direct mm -hmm. uh, view mm -hmm. of what, to, what went into that story. How did you get, where, you know, mm -hmm. what were your sources? And, mm -hmm. and they can't often reveal their sources, mm -hmm. but how'd you, how did you get onto the story? So it, I think that's mm -hmm. an interesting interplay right. mm -hmm. uh, between the newspaper world and the television world. And to oh, me, yeah. that somewhat works. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, again, you've got the newspapers doing the hard digging and, and pr mm -hmm. pr producing the lengthier articles mm -hmm. to read, but now people get introduced to that and get some context for that story mm -hmm. by watching television. Then they might be right. prompted to go back, oh, I want to read that New York Times story now. I want to see exactly. what's, mm -hmm. what's really involved there. So. Terry Gross does that on Fresh Air. Oh, yeah. Amy That's Goodman right. does that on Democracy Now! Right. Brings in the reporters to talk about the depth. And right. I think that's really helpful, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it has in some ways been that reaction, though, huh? uh, right? It's, it's having a good villain, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, gets, gets, I think the New York Times, absolutely, uh, you know, they had a Super Bowl commercial last year, Facts Matter, right? The New mm -hmm. York Times was all black screen. You know, they've done several, I think, right back at you things directed toward Trump mm -hmm. specifically about, yeah. you know, we are the the fourth estate yeah. and we do matter <laughs> and the free press is one of the most important things and I think it's been absolutely reactionary and that's also okay. Yeah. You bet. You bet. Yeah. Now, now a lot of this to me is fed by the Mueller investigation, right? Mm -hmm. Because so many uh, charges were leveled against this president and its, uh, yeah. his team about their collusion with Russian officials. <clears throat> during the election campaign, which then, of course, led to an FBI investigation. Mm -hmm. Trump then fired Comey, which is like setting the house on fire, right? Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and right. Then, so then that eventually led to the appointment of the special prosecutor, the special mm -hmm. counsel, Robert Mueller. And so the Mueller investigation has been ongoing. And apparently it just drives Trump completely crazy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in addition to investigating the collusion, 
Trump has, at almost every turn, tried to obstruct the investigation. And I don't mm -hmm. think that's too strong a term. I mean, yeah. no. clearly, one of the charges that will come out of the Mueller investigation is obstruction of justice. I think so. Mm -hmm. And I think the President of the United States will be indicted mm -hmm. on obstruction of justice. Now, whether that will stick up in court or not, but I, yeah. I think pretty clearly, in a month or two, maybe by summer, I think Robert Mueller is going to indict Donald Trump yeah. for obstruction mm -hmm. of justice. Now, so the Mueller investigation is ongoing. The Trump administration is attempting to thwart it. And the media has been covering it. The That's media exactly. has yeah. been digging. I mean, this is, this is like, all right, let's we, get into this now. Let's, we got let's something help to out. go let, here. You know, let's, something to sink our teeth in. Because of the efforts to obstruct, I think the media has felt a special role to push back and Absolutely. to try to, mm -hmm. to see what they can find and uncover. Right. right. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they've been very helpful. Yeah. So good. So, so one of the issues that's percolating right now is this uh, memo. That, and, and again, I think it's not a memo. And it's a, right. People keep referring to it as a classified memo. Yeah. It's a series of notes that were taken by Nunez, Devin yeah. Nunez. At these meetings, correct? Is well, by going through okay. classified reports. Okay. You've been going through classified reports from the FBI and the Justice Department yeah. and the FISA court. And he, and he took notes. Uh, and he's trying to highlight certain uh, aspects mm -hmm. of, of uh, these classified materials. So his own memo then becomes classified because it's based on looking oh, at classified right. materials. Right. So, but it's not really a, it's not a classified memo in and of itself. It's mm -hmm. his take, okay. his uh, effort to pull out of these classified reports what he wants to use in a partisan political way. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be clear. The purpose of the new uh, uh, the, the memo is to um, impeach or to impugn the FBI yeah, and the Justice correct. Department, protect uh, Trump. Uh, essentially, it's an effort to obstruct justice. Yes. Yeah, so. I mean, very clearly, that's what this memo is all about. So then, on yeah. social media and Fox News, you get this, you know, release the memo, you know, declassify the memo, release the memo, uh, get this out there. But again, the memo itself is a highly distorted uh, right. piece of information. He has cherry-picked. Right. Mm -hmm. He has gone through these classified reports and cherry-picked, pulled out certain things. Sometimes it's the, the time frame is off. It's, he's he's mm -hmm. pulling facts out but not getting the timeline correct. Uh, he's not allowing anybody a, an opportunity to respond. Yeah. The FBI took the unusual step to come out and say, there's a lot of things that were left out of this memo that yeah. you know, render it you know, mm -hmm. a false uh, narrative. It's a false narrative. He left out, you know, 90% yeah. of what happened. He pulled out 10% to make us look bad, but he didn't talk about the other 90%. And so it's cherry-picked, and it ends up creating a false narrative. Yeah. And, of course, it's all for the purpose of trying to protect Trump and to try to undermine. Mm. Now, who, who, how many of you would ever imagine, Lynn, can you ever imagine, re the Republican this Party, the Republican politicians attempting to undermine no. the law enforcement agencies of the United States? <laughs> no, <laughs> exactly. To undermine the FBI and the Justice Department, exactly. you know, the law and order party. <laughs> yeah, right. No, total, like, right, you know, not that I'm too sad that they, <laughs> they seem to be. <laughs> oh, my right. gosh. But, Talk about losing one of your pillars of, of ideological points and something that the Republican Party has stood for for forever, right. really. Uh, for them to be attacking our own FBI, it, it tells you everything you need to know about the political landscape and the situation mm -hmm. and that this is mm -hmm. about trying to protect Trump and that essentially, apparently, anything goes um, right. in order to keep to keep that status quo in, in place. Well, not to mention they've lo lost a lot of the rest of their platform with this particular le election, family values. Right. I would say used to be a very important <laughs> uh, pillar the of the Republican Party. Pay paying up porn stars doesn't Trump is, uh, qualify you know, as family exempt, values. Right? <laughs> exempt from that. He's also exempt from law enforcement. He's, he, he, gets, he gets the pass. He gets the exemption. And, and they're, they're losing their own platform and ideology in the process. And I think that can only hurt the Republican Party. And so, therefore, I'm not too sad about it. Um, but that's, that's what's happening, sure. Right. And, and there's a deeper issue here. So part of the reason to have this Nunez memo uh, declassified, released to the public now, is to create a firestorm of criticism that will be directed yeah. at Rod Rosenstein right. in the Justice Department. Right. Because he's the one 
who's overseeing the Mueller investigation since uh, the Attorney General Sessions had to recuse himself because he yeah. was involved in all of this. Now Rosenstein is the one guiding the Mueller investigation. Yeah. They want Rosenstein out uh, because they want to fire Mueller. They can't fire Mueller if, if Rosenstein is in their way because he won't do it. So he would either, if they asked him to do it, he would resign. They'd have to go down the, the food chain oh boy. <laughs> to try to find somebody. Again, some people have been referring to this as kind of a slow motion Saturday Night Massacre. Yeah, yeah. right. Oh. Reviewing back to the sure. Nixon uh, era when Nixon had to go down to find somebody in the Justice Department that would fire what? Archibald Cox, the yeah. special right. prosecutor in that case. Mm -hmm. Right. So the Nunez memo is clearly designed to try to make a case so Trump can say, well, Rosenstein did this or did that, and therefore he has to go. And so once Rosenstein's out, then of course they're going to put their own person right. in there. Now right. again, it's, what's also important to point out here, Comey, who was the director of the FBI, and Rosenstein, uh, and, and Robert Mueller, they're all Republicans. Yeah, <laughs> they're exactly. They're all Republicans. I mean, we're not talking about left-wing Democrats no. who are out uh, to get Donald Trump here. These are Republican officials right. who are professionals and see a duty and they're performing their duty. Uh, and yet, because it threatens the Trump presidency, they've got to go. And so the New Year's memo is an effort to undermine the FBI and to cast out on the Justice Department, create a pretext to oh, get yeah. rid of Rosenstein, uh, and then... So and then remind of course, us of our history. How did that work for Nixon? <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work. You think that, that you know, so good. that playbook, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we'll have the yeah. same reactionary uh, effect right. today, if not worse than it did I for that administration. The backlash will be yeah. powerful. Yeah. 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 On the other hand, we've got a media situation uh, where, where folks want to believe that this president is untouchable. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that they're he's willing being to excuse. And, but you know, the Democrats are already on the move. Well, what's the, the Democratic who's the second leader in that uh, committee? Um, I can't oh, remember. Adam Schiff. Yes. He's out there speaking, yes. saying Correct, the same yeah. thing that you're saying right now, all out of context, not taking so a lot of stuff left out of this thing, no credibility at all. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, So I think it will backlash. I yeah. think there will be a lot of backlash. I and, hope so. and apparently there's even some concern in the White House that maybe this is going to be a dud. Because here's the other thing, and Lynn, I, I want you to kind of chime in here, because what's, what to me is really, really different about our era right mm. now is that you have one television network on cable television that is basically the Trump, is Trump TV. Right, yes. exactly. Fox News is exactly. Trump TV. Now here's Sean Hannity talking about this memo and playing it up to the hilt and saying, this is the greatest political scandal in American history. Yeah. He actually said that. <laughs> yes. He said that the other day. He said, this is the greatest political scandal in American history. When this memo comes out, it's going to be shocking to the American people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I just think that's so, I mean, what's the, Whoa. What's, Talk what is hyperbole? Gross, <laughs> gross exaggeration for effect. Uh, and, and this is gross exaggeration. I mean, uh, this is not the greatest political scandal. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And, it, and again, it focuses on one particular person who was involved in the Trump campaign, a guy named Carter yeah. Page, yeah. Yeah. who's a bit of a goofball, I, yeah. who's been an, interviewed on, on television many times and basically has admitted, yeah, I, I did meet I, with, mm -hmm. I met with the Russians during the Republican National Convention <laughs> in Cleveland right. and he went to, he went to Russia and he gave right. a couple of speeches and right. he's actually had all these contacts. And so uh, he was targeted as somebody that maybe we need to kind of mm -hmm. see what this guy's up to. And so there was a request for a, a FISA, Foreign right. Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, warrant to, to check into this yeah. guy. And this is the scandal now, right? Well, right. Rosenstein never should have approved the third or fourth effort to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that somehow this was uh, showed bias on the part right. of the mm -hmm. Justice Department and Rosenstein that this was out of bounds. Well, this guy had already clearly demonstrated that he was involved in these activities. Yeah. You know, it's probable cause exactly. clearly existed. <laughs> From the get-go, probable cause existed. So the issue yeah. of a FISA warrant was clearly warranted at this point. How could yeah. this be the greatest scandal in American history oh when, when such a warrant was easily there? But, but Lynn, getting back to my point about Fox, mm. isn't that different? I mean, we've never had one 
very powerful television network mm -hmm. that reaches a, a millions of people that is devoted to one political party and to one political ideology right. to such an extreme, have we? I, I, I don't know of any. I mean, right. I think there have been right. smidgens of those the kind of things happening. Um, but I, I think um, in, 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 one of the things that impresses me about some of the things said in here is that uh, we're dealing with, with political um, culture mm -hmm. in talking about this, and, and we've we got to do what I think um, has been talked about, and that is to look at image politics. And if I could yeah. give a name to uh, the Fox things, its main focus and purpose is to create an image yeah. that other people can uh, internalize mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a rationalization for why they need to do it, to do whatever needs to be done in the way that it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And um, so you've got this image of a crusader, uh, which is what Fox News really turns out to be. Um, you know, it's yeah. almost medieval in <laughs> its, uh, mm -hmm. wow. its okay. efforts wow. to, uh, to play that role. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then you think about, well, what kind of people fit in with a, an agenda which wants to save other people from those awful thing that, things that are going to happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, I think they get their power and authority from um, having that crusading mm -hmm. kind of, uh, of um, purpose. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, what does that do to, to people? It makes them feel very comfortable That's because right. they've got right. somebody out there protecting them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doesn't matter whether they're telling the truth or not. It just matters whether they, whether they, sort of throw the cloak of um, of uh, verisimilitude uh, mm -hmm. over people's mm -hmm. eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 uh, what we talked about before, everything's simple. It's yes, easy absolutely. to understand. So right. okay, good. Yes, I get exactly. it. Now. Yeah. Black and white connect yeah. dots out in very yeah. right. Yeah. The, the other thing that's so interesting about what you're saying is, you know, from all reports, right, of course, the, Donald Trump is an image, he's a brand. Mm -hmm. but there's yeah. nothing yeah. else there. And so right. what better, uh, you know, if you're going to do image politics, he's your guy, yeah. right? I mean, right. this is the best branding scheme ever. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. 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 So, so I, I think that uh, what's different from even when Neil Postman was writing Amusing Ourselves to Death, uh, he was only at the analyzing at the beginning of the rise of cable television, right? Yeah. And it seems to me that cable television, which allows for the development of a Fox News, which appeals to conservative voters, or later an MSNBC, which sort of caters more to a liberal perspective, mm -hmm. or CNN, which tries to play it mm -hmm. down the middle. But, but you get this kind of fracturing right. of the audience, yeah. uh, for right. one thing, which right. allows you then to select the media that you want to go to based on your own political ideology. What makes yeah. me feel good, right? What, what reinforces what I already think or what I already believe, right. I can now go yeah. have my right. confirmation bias is That's, the term yep. that we use, right, mm -hmm. in social sciences. And, and cable news, it seems to me, allows for that a lot more than back in the old days, right? I mean, <laughs> back in the old days, let's go back to uh, the old days, the 60s, right? Uh, <laughs> and, there were there were three networks, yeah. right? That's so all. you know you had, you had Walter to, Cronkite, yeah. mm -hmm. you had Huntley and Brinkley, and I don't even remember who was on ABC in those days, but uh -huh. but yeah, you, but you had that. you had these people. They were always white males, yes. older mm -hmm. white males, but but nonetheless, they had a kind of gravitas to them, mm -hmm. yeah. and they had a kind of seriousness of purpose. They were objective, I think, in the mm -hmm. in sort of the best sense of that word. Mm -hmm. That they they you know. Was Walter Cronkite a Republican or a Democrat? I, w I have no idea, and I never even thought about it in those days. Or John Chancellor, who followed Huntley and Brinkley mm -hmm. on NBC. But these men were very authoritative when they presented the news, mm -hmm. and it, was, it appeared to be a very objective uh, mm -hmm. presentation. I'm sure we could pick it apart and find ideological biases that were hidden in there. But nonetheless, it was a, a very different time, right? And yeah. there wasn't all this choice. I mean, it's not like you were going to search through, oh, Walter Cronkite, I don't want to hear what he has right. to say. I'm going to go find 
right. fact. Well, there was no fact, yeah. right? So, I mean, <laughs> right. you, were, you were limited, right? You only had those three major networks, and you got pretty much the same, the same story, story yeah. from you know, whether it was John Chancellor on NBC or whether it was Walter Cronkite. Yeah. Right? But those men also had a measure of trust. The American public mm -hmm. trusted them. Walter Cronkite may have been the most trusted man in America mm -hmm. in right. the 1960s, right. uh, given everything that was mm -hmm. happening with Vietnam and, and just his coverage of the space program and his report from Vietnam in 68. And so, you know, Walter Cronkite was the most trusted mm -hmm. man. There never will be any news person who will have that kind of trust mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, in our in our fractured media world today, mm -hmm. and that's not even talking about social media, Twitter, right. and right. Facebook, and right. Instagram, and everything else. But but I think the the TV world is mm -hmm. different in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely, yeah. yeah, yeah. We expect to be entertained by television, right? Mm -hmm. And that's clearly uh, for Postman. I think that's clearly uh, mm -hmm. what has destroyed. Um, the typographic age, yeah. mm -hmm. that uh, you don't have to have any special qualifications mm -mm. to understand um, what's, what's going on with a, a person who's informing us about the news um, because it's not, it's entertainment for most people. It's yeah. not news. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And many of the stories, if you watch the CBS Evening News, many of the stories yeah. are just about right. entertainment. Right. Yeah. Okay. And we know definitely when the story is over because the news people to say, and now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, whales that talk English or yeah. something. You know yeah, what I mean? It's, it's There's it's our something. big news of the week, you know? Yeah. I think, whoa, the, wait a the minute. The trivialization. Yeah, yeah the of, trivialization. Yeah. And of course, you have to have time, and on the local broadcast, you got to have time for the weather and report, the sports. which oh, is yeah. the most important mm -hmm. thing, right? That's right. Yeah. I mean, right. Keith Thompson's the most important person at Channel no, 3, exactly. uh, right? <laughs> because people want to know what the weather's going to be like, right? Yeah. And then, of course, you got to get the sports report in there, right? Right. right. And yeah. they're cutting that, too. Yeah. So. And you can't interfere with that. So you shrink your amount of time that you're going to have for hard news to begin with. It's such uh, a uh, yeah, it's such a dichotomy though, right? Because we've called this age the information age. Oh, mm -hmm. right. And if we really, yeah. you know, believed our friends on the other side of the aisle and free market and choice is better and having all of this right out there is, is supposed to make us smarter and we'll have all this information at our fingertips uh, that was supposed to make us smarter and better somehow mm -hmm. and instead it's fractured us yeah. and led to less critical thinking, you know, as an educator, right, and looking at right. our students, I'm not sure they can tell the difference between news and amusement. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And yeah. so in some ways, though, that's helped. Well, what's your source for that? Mm -hmm. And they all know. They're complete cynics about, uh, well, they say that and these people say that. So why shouldn't I just listen to the people who agree with me? Because we're right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, that, and, right and then right. it builds this other culture of... Uh, because we know there's partisanship, right? In, in my world, right? Climate change. You know, Fox News reports this much, and CNN does this much, and MSNBC does this much. Uh, so when you're only reinforcing that system in a supposed information age, I'm not sure how we we right. get to critical thinking uh, yeah, again. No. You right? go back to books. You go back oh, to books. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Making, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and the other thing here, I mean, we have a fracturing yeah. with cable, but at the same time, at the, uh, at the highest levels in terms of ownership and control, you have concentration. I think, yeah, Much that's more. the point. Mm. Uh, and, uh. and so now, and again, Ben Bag Dick, Dickian talked about this back in the 80s with right. his book Media Monopoly, right. which I know you used to use in courses that you taught. Right. But he was talking about how corporate the corporate entities have taken control and consolidated uh, news coverage, right? And their purpose is not to inform. Inform or educate. <laughs> or educate. It's to brand. It's to, it's to brand. And to market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to yeah. market, yeah. Imagine but, if mm -hmm. we had a different newscaster who had a, a degree from, uh, degrees from the most prestigious universities yeah. in journalism. Imagine if, yeah. if we had a rotation of those people mm -hmm. rather than the, uh, the uh, well-dressed, well-groomed, right. and, and sometimes well-informed, but most of the time they're showmen. Yeah. yeah, right. Um, and, and I think that one effort to, to try to stop that is national public ra t radio and public television. Mm -hmm. And they're going after that and trying to cut oh, their yeah. money for that and just right. mm. eliminate as much of that as, 
as possible. Yeah, so if you don't have a corporate sponsor or someone right. behind you, then what does that look like? That looks like a very different model, right? Yeah. Just like, what does this look like? <laughs> yeah, and then you've got the problem of, uh, of who are the corporations that are making donations to these large yep. yeah. second parties that are, are um, promoting yeah. uh, some of the things that we're seeing PBS on, and all. on PBS. Yeah. yeah, it's hard, it's hard. Well, and there's less and less of that on there. Frontline is on once in a while right. and some mm -hmm. other stuff, mm -hmm. but there's less and less of that. Yeah, really to bring this all together in my mind, think about what is Russia really about, you know, and part of what the Russian intervention in our election was about was utilizing social media to yeah. put out, uh, right. uh, you know, hate, fear, this image branding thing that people could identify with to move the political scale. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's such a, a timely, unfortunate example of exactly the things that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I want to put in a plug for a, a, a book that uh, I think is a, is a current counter, uh, you know, following from Neil Postman's amazing book, which, and again, can't say enough about Neil Postman. When was that? What year is that. is that? That was published in 1985. Yeah. Okay. Huh? 1985. So he was so far seen in yeah, that huh? book. It's just an amazing book. But I want to talk about another book that's uh, come out. It actually was first published by Susan Jacoby oh, yes. uh, in 19, uh, 19, 2008. Okay. <laughs> the Age of American Unreason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she's so now we're 10 years out from the original publication yeah. of that book, and now she's updated it for the oh. Trump era. So it has a sort of a new title, The Age of American Unreason and a Culture of Lies. Yeah. But I think really an outstanding job of, oh. of talking about a lot of the things, the issues we've been talking about today, the way in which as a culture, we are mm -hmm. moving away from uh, you know, focusing for the, the context and uh, use of logic and evidence yeah. and the growing role that television is playing in the decontextualizing of information right, right. Yeah. and the <clears throat> growing culture of lies that we see within the political system and uh, the impact yeah. of uh, the cable networks like Fox News pursuing a particular ideology. So again, I, I highly recommend that book for people mm -hmm. that are interested in some of the themes okay. that we've been talking about today. Look if you want to focus on that a bit more, I get, think it's a good follow-up to uh, Neil Postman. You Ooh. should go back and read Postman, though, <laughs> if you haven't had a chance to read this amazing book. Oh. Uh, wow. Uh, on the local scene also, uh, we, you know, again, I think what's happening, we know in terms of the major cable networks mm -hmm. and oh. news networks, we have this growing corporate control and domination, mm -hmm. but uh, that's even happening at the local level as uh, yeah. Sinclair Broadcasting, for example is a, a corporation, very conservative political views, and they have bought up tons and tons and tons of local yeah. TV stations, right. including Channel 3 right here in, in Kalamazoo, WWMT, mm -hmm. and they own that station. Mm -hmm. And they exert control over some of the content in sort of sometimes subtle ways and other times very blatantly. Mm -hmm. uh, they have this terrorism, terrorism watch desk. Terrorism report. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, right, the terrorism. Yeah. Just, we want you to be afraid. Be afraid. Mm -hmm. Be very and, and afraid. They, they, they also have corporate editorials that they oh, insist that terrible. the local stations run, whether the local people want to do it or not. Yeah. And I'm not trying to impugn anybody at Channel 3 because I, I do think uh, mm -hmm. most of the news people there do a, a fantastic job but their parent company does attempt to insert a kind of ideological yeah, yeah. storyline if they can, if they can, on what's happening. And uh, they're, they're more or less successful at, at that at other stations across the country. But the fact that one giant company with a very conservative ideological bent owns so many local yeah. television stations and is able to try to influence mm -hmm. the way in which the news is covered in that way is another frightening prospect to mm -hmm. me, I think. As yeah. well. And the same with newspapers, right? I mean, much yep. more. Yep. The yep. media monopoly, the growing concentration. Yeah. So I think that's know. important. It's a, it's that's the answer to my uh, my earlier quandary, right? If if freedom of information, this is the information age, and more is better. Well, there's never really been a free market, and there's never really been free choice if there's this kind of domination and control right. of mm -hmm. that source, right? Yeah. So yeah. you don't really get that that interplay ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank right. goodness for public media network. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you exactly. for doing what you do. Huh? <laughs> well, uh, since we're being somewhat nostalgic today about uh, how the news was covered in an earlier era, uh, I think it's very interesting that there's a new movie out called The, the, Post. the Post. Yes. 
And of course, if people don't know uh, the backdrop to the Post, it's the Post is the Washington Post newspaper, and it's the story set back in, in 1971 when the Pentagon Papers were released. And Daniel Ellsberg mm -hmm. uh, had access to the Pentagon Papers. They told the story about how the United States became involved in Vietnam, exposed all the lies yeah. that led us into, uh, into Vietnam, and Ellsberg felt that that story had to get out. So basically he photocopied all mm -hmm. the, the papers, the secret hidden history, if you will, yeah. uh, of the Vietnam War, and he uh, got them to the New York Times, Neil Sheehan at the New York yep. Times. And so it was the New York Times that first published the story in, in June of 1971. But then the Nixon administration, even though they, they weren't covered by the history, uh, it was all about earlier administrations, you know, from Eisenhower, Kennedy to Johnson, yeah, and their involvement. But the, but Nixon convinced yeah. by Kissinger that hey, we can't allow this. To, you know, we're still involved in this war. We can't allow people to really understand what's going on yeah. and yeah. how we got into this. And so they went to court. They got an injunction yeah. against the New York Times to stop the publication of the Pentagon Papers. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, the Washington Post had acquired the papers as well. This is where Ben Bagdikian comes in because he was a reporter and editor at the Washington Post at the time. Before he went on to a distinguished career as a scholar, a scholar uh, right. educator in terms of media, he was the uh, chair of the journalism school at Berkeley mm -hmm. uh, and wrote that, that great book, Media Monopoly. Mm -hmm. So Ben Bagdikian knew Ellsberg and somehow got the paper. So, mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the Washington Post has to decide, are they going to, are yeah. they going to publish them now? And has big star value because uh, yeah. you know two of our greatest actors, yeah, Meryl right. Streep and Tom Hanks, mm -hmm. yes. are, are in this movie. Uh, Meryl Streep plays Catherine Graham, mm -hmm. the owner of the Post, uh, publisher of the Post, mm -hmm. who had to make the critical decision. And I don't, you know, spoiler alert: they, they decide <laughs> they do decide to publish them. Uh, I think that's. Uh, yeah, but even though you know the history, you know how yeah, it's going to turn no, out. They, the movie they still did it well. pulls you in. Yeah. It's a very well done movie, and. and but, but again, it gets back to, an, and, and Steven Spielberg is the one who mm -hmm. has uh, put this movie together. Yeah. And so uh, I think Spielberg is trying to uh, make a comment about the Trump era, right? Mm -hmm. a and a, ro a, a comment about the critical role of the media mm -hmm. in the Trump era, because this was important. This Very was, important. This was so important. Great reaction. At the time, back in the summer of 71, to... Yeah to get this out and to have this battle, this showdown, because the Nixon right. administration was attempting mm -hmm. to impose prior restraint on the press. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Which had never been done before. And so the Supreme yeah. Court had to make a decision. Were they gonna, were they gonna allow the newspapers to publish these, uh, these documents? So have you seen the movie? Oh yeah, okay. it was great. I really yeah. it take it back. So, and the Supreme Court, what was the decision? Five to four? Six to three. Yeah. Six to three. It was a six to three decision in favor of allowing the Times and the Post both to continue publishing right. mm -hmm. uh, the Pentagon Papers. Yeah. I remember the impact of that. Um, yeah, was it was that? huge. Mm -hmm. It yeah. had such a huge impact. Yeah. Right. But, but again, the, the movie takes you back in so many ways because it goes back to what newspapering was like mm -hmm. in an earlier yes. era, right? When they had these yeah. real uh, phones or something. They had real <laughs> rotary <people>. dial phones. <laughs> and, uh, just the way in which they set up the press to, for the press yeah. run. And, right. Yeah. You know, no cell phones were around, right? Yeah. Uh, ben, when Ben Bagdickian is going out to call Ellsberg, he's got to go <laughs> he's out and find, go a, find a pay an old pay phone, you know, right. which yeah. we don't even have anymore. They've got right? a tough time finding and, one uh, now, really. <laughs> But, but I think, you know, again, it's taking us back to an earlier era, and I think it's saying, look, the press played a critical role right. at, a, at this time in American history, and uh, shouldn't the press be playing that same role today? Yeah. Uh, yes. And can we, can we still do it? Can the press still do it? I think that was sort of the question that Spielberg's trying to raise yeah. uh, by, by putting this movie, The Post, out. Have you had a chance to see it I yet? I haven't or? seen it yet, yeah. so uh, yeah. uh, now I'll definitely go. Oh, but yeah. I, yeah. I, I, think, I think that's exactly what we were talking about. Yeah, the Times and the Post are doing that with the Mueller investigation, with some other in-depth, you know, breaking investigations over the last couple of years. And, Maybe people are reading papers again because yeah, of that too. That? So yeah. how about that, right? Glenn, you haven't had a chance to see the movie yet. I don't think. I, I haven't. Uh, we'll go together. About the, <laughs> uh, so uh, anything that struck you in terms of what you've been reading about this particular movie or um, its, ro its role here? Oh, I'm waiting. I'm kind of um, reserving judgment until uh, <laughs> so <you can> <laughs> yeah. I've seen it. And, yeah, yeah. Um, 
I, um, uh, I know we must be uh, pretty much, uh, time must be important. Yeah, at we're this getting point. down there. Yeah, we're um, getting down in the last couple of minutes here. I, but. I want to put in a, a pitch for uh, a, a argument of postman's. Okay. Since we're all teachers and we all deal with students, um, he says that knowledge, uh, and I'm, I'm going to read just a little okay, bit. Okay. Sure. Knowledge of a, of a subject means knowledge of the language of that subject. And biology's got its language, poli sci's got its language, mm -hmm. history's got its language. And he says if you eliminate all the words of a subject, you've eliminated the subject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, biology is not plants. And animals, it's a language about plants and animals. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to skip a little bit. He says, therefore, there are two levels of knowing a subject, which is what we're, mm. we're trying to uh, get at and expose. Uh, there is a student who knows what the definition of a noun or a gene or a molecule is. Then there is the student who shares that knowledge, but who also knows that the definition was arri how it was arrived at. There is the student who can answer a question. Then there is the student who knows what are the base bases mm. of that question. And then there is a student who can give you facts. Then there is a student who also knows what is meant by a fact. Yeah. Wow. Mm. And I thought that's say? such a beautiful description of um, the extraction process, if yeah. that's a good word, mm -hmm. uh, that takes place in a medium mm -hmm. that uh, doesn't also have uh, written down words, I mean, published words mm -hmm. uh, about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And why, uh, for some of us, why we are stuck in a book world <laughs> yeah. rather than the entertainment world. Yeah. Well, Lynn, thanks so much for, for bringing that in, and thank you for being here. It's been yes. great to great. have you with us again. Enjoyed uh, it. You're welcome <laughs> to come back anytime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Again, we'll, we'll let Neil Postman have the last word. Lawrence O'Donnell always says, who has the last word on his program? I think we'll, we'll let Neil Postman have, <laughs> the and Lynn word. Bartley have the last words That's today right. on our program. Perfect. We'd like to thank you for joining us on Critical Issues, Alternative Views. We hope you join us again soon.